Make some noise if you're excited to be in church. Come on, guys. Amen. Amen. We're excited that you are here, man. It's been a great start to this year. In fact, last Sunday, we had a record-breaking day. We had like record salvations and people coming to Discovery Church. Over 2,500 people came last Sunday to church, man. Isn't that crazy? Pretty awesome. However, I, we've opened up some spaces for you guys, man. We got the overflow space, which is this cool outdoor venue, heating area, like an LED wall experience. That available and kind of open up more classroom space as this gets filled up more. Just know there's more room, not only out you know, side for you, but you can always come to 8 a.m., y'all. You can come a little bit earlier. There's a little bit more room in there, y'all. 1130 is even worse than this one, so don't try coming to that one. You say better not, okay? You come to, or the 630, there's some room in those, in those services if you guys uh, feel like this is a bit too much, parking and stuff like that, but that's a good problem to have. Isn't that a good problem to have, amen? It just has been, and not just that, that like that's, it's been an amazing start to this year, powerful um, experience in our 21 days of prayer and fasting concludes today. Hallelujah. Amen. Somebody was like, yes, meat. You know what I mean? So, uh, we're going we're gonna, to, we're gonna, feasting today is, is happening probably. So we're, we're, we're concluding, but it's been an amazing like uh, journey for me. I know for you guys as well, this, this, this focus. We began this year with this theme, a word, focus, that is more than, more than a series, you know, and we are diving through this, but it's our, our word for this year. In fact, as we like led into this year, knowing like this was going to be our focus, the series changed. The focus of focus changed on me as I prayed and fasted and looked at what God wanted us to, to focus on. I, I, originally, I had like these things that God wanted us to focus on, and there's all throughout the scripture, there's different areas of focus. And so I did a lot of study about that as well, but as I prayed and fasted, I felt like the Lord was shifting our focus, kind of like, like not what we're focusing on, but how we're focusing. It's almost like, you, you know, you got binoculars and, and you got to have to fix the focus. You have to adjust the lens on a little bit. I feel like in this series, God has just been adjusting our lens or our perspective or the lens of what we're viewing through. Not so much of like what we're looking at, but the lens that we're viewing through, the perspective that we're viewing through. And I, and I believe that God is, uh, has began a great work that I hope that this year can be um, the most blessed year of your life, because I believe it, man, if you fix your focus, God will fix your future, amen? Let's look at it again, Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. Um, I think today, everything, we're going to conclude the series, but everything we've discussed leads us to the topic today, Proverbs 29, 18. If people can't see what God is doing, Okay, if we can't, if we can't, if we don't get it, if we can't see it, we're going to continue to stumble all over ourselves. We're going to stumble through our relationships, stumble through, here's the next job and the next relationship and the next thing. We'll just continue to stumble all over ourselves if we cannot see what God is doing. We're going to continue to make a mess of stuff. He says, but when we do, when we attend to what he reveals, that's where our blessing comes from. That's where the blessed life comes from, is from the revelation the revelation of God, attending to the revelation of God. Let me lay some groundwork where, uh, for where God wants to take us today. We've read this verse, Matthew chapter 6, 33. Let me kind of peel back some more and go a little bit deeper. It says, but seek first, Jesus says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. There's a question for you guys. What does it mean to seek the kingdom? When, you know, Jesus tells us, hey, man, seek the kingdom. What does that mean, to seek the, the kingdom? What is the kingdom? What is the, what is the kingdom of God? That word king, kingdom, it's, it's, it's dome as dominion. It's the dominion of the king. How would he so, to seek the dominion of the king, the king's domain? Not in your notes, but to seek the kingdom is this. It means Jesus asking us, to do this, it, we're, 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 it means I'm looking, I'm seeking, I'm looking for God's dominion to be realized in a specific situation. You know in the Lord's Prayer where Jesus said, your kingdom come, your will be done that we've been talking about. When the kingdom of God comes into a situation, the king's domain comes into a situation, that situation surrenders to the authority and the power of God that is released. Like in Matthew chapter 
12, verse 28, Jesus said, but if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you, are manifested upon you. What happened here was there is a breakthrough in the heavenly realm. The kingdom of God came into our natural reality and breakthrough happened. The king's domain showed up. The domain of God's kingdom. That's why Jesus said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Whatever is in the king's domain in heaven, I want to see released on this earth. Seek his kingdom. I, I, I want to see the domain of, his, of heaven, I want to see it released here. And likewise, what, whatever is not in the king's domain, whatever is not in heaven that is on earth, I declare God's dominion to be released in that situation. Whatever is not. So, so for instance, that's why we pray for illness and over diseases. It's not like cancer or something like that. You know, that's why we lay hands and we over, over the sick because there is no cancer in heaven. There is no illness in heaven. There is no sickness on earth as it is in heaven. So when I see something manifesting on earth that does not belong in heaven, what I seek to do, what Jesus is saying, seek the kingdom of God, what I seek to do is release God's dominion and authority over everything that is not of heaven. I'm looking for heaven solutions to earthly problems. I'm looking for heaven solutions. I'm seeking the kingdom. I'm not going to solve these things with earthly bread. No, no, no. I'm, I want the solution of heaven to be released in this situation. Let me show you two principles of the king's domain to set up where we're going today. I'm just trying to set this up, okay? Let me, let me give you some scriptures. This scripture first, Matthew chapter 6, 10, before the point. Jesus, remember, he, he's telling us how to pray. He's, he's answering the question how, how to pray. It's called the Lord's Prayer. We've talked about this a little bit. Jesus said, this then is how you should pray. Our Father. Will you circle that? Our Father somewhere? Like, like, like our Father in heaven. I want you to notice what it starts with there. Our Father. He doesn't start with my Father. He's teaching us our Father. Here's the principle. When we operate out of the context of the family, we are out of the kingdom. Oftentimes in a Western culture, we emphasize individuality instead of community. The emphasis is on the individual instead of the family. But anytime we remove ourselves from the subject of family, we remove ourselves from the subject of the kingdom. So whenever we kind of, we're trying to deal with a situation or whatever, and we kind of disconnect or we handle that situation, disconnect from the community of faith or the community of God, then I am removing myself from the domain of God's kingdom in that situation. And this is what God always wanted. Ephesians tells us, not you notes, but chapter 1, verse 5 says, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing himself to us through Christ Jesus. Like so this is important that you don't understand that God's kingdom operates as a kingdom of community. It's a family is what it operates. But what does the answer to this prayer look like? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Our holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. We talked about that last week, your will. On earth as it is in heaven. What does the answer look like? How many times have we prayed prayers like this not knowing even what we're praying for? Not knowing what, what, what to look for. But we just, we got happy that we even prayed it. We, we felt like a check mark. I prayed. <laughs> not knowing that, like, so, so we're actually getting affirmation from the fact that we prayed, not the fact that there was breakthrough in the prayer. What does the answer to this prayer look like? What, what does seeking the kingdom look like? How do I know this, this, this like, like God is telling me this is working? He's not telling me just to say this, but to, there's something that's evident that happens through this. What does seeking the kingdom look like? I would submit to you today that this looks like love. That the kingdom of God looks like love released. Write it down like this. The foundational value of the kingdom of God is love. Why? Because God is love. Everything he does comes from that place of love, comes from his nature of love. Even when he disciplines us, 
The Bible tells us he disciplines us. Why? Because he loves us. So everything he does is from his nature of love. Here's why this is so important. Because of this broken world and, and broken people and the enemy's targeted in strategic attacks, our ability to love and to operate from love has been damaged. And anything that does not come from love, listen, does not come from the kingdom of God. God is love. And I was made in his image. So I'm at my best when I love. See, you can hammer a nail into a board with a crescent wrench. But it's out of its design. See, many people function in life out of their design, but they think, because I can still hammer the, the nail into it, so to speak, <laughs> that I'm okay. All is well. But it's in discovering our design, what I was born for, that releases me into my potential and to my eternal purpose. This is what you were born for. What you were designed for was love. Luke chapter 10, 27. Look what it says. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and all your mind. I was designed to be a lover of God with everything I am, every part of my being, my heart, soul, mind, and strength. You ever hear the phrase, they're so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good? You ever hear that? That's ridiculous. It's impossible. The only way to be of any earthly good is to be heavenly minded. Are y'all with me this morning? You were designed to love God. Culture is trying to remove design. Wouldn't you agree? Things that would have gotten you an appointment with a psychiatrist five to ten years ago are now applauded as noble. It's insane. You cannot violate God's design. And it's not just sexual orientation, it's life itself. I was born to be loved by God and to love him in return. And part of that expression of my love for God is measurable in my love for people. And then he says, love others, love your neighbor as yourself. But the moment you remove the concept of a creator, and that's been the goal of the enemy all along, you guys. There is no design. You can't have a design without a designer. So if we move the concept of a design, there is no design. And where there is no design, there's no purpose. And when there's no purpose, there's no destiny. And when there is no destiny, there's no accountability. Every person was born for this. All of our design was created to love God. So check this out. Anything that does not come from love does not come from the kingdom of God. So if you have problems today, listen, with any intimacy, with trust, with being loved and being vulnerable, opening up and letting people in or expressing love, those barriers of loving people well. It's so much bigger than those struggles and what happened to you that caused them. The reality is the grand scheme of the enemy is this, to remove you from being able to operate from the king's domain, from realizing God's dominion in your situation. Blame it on whatever you want, hurts, wounds, offenses, people. The reality is my ability to love was diminished. It was an attack on my design. I was designed to be loved and experienced and to give love. And, and see, it wasn't really about that hurt or that offense. It was actually a targeted strategic attack of the enemy to get you out of the kingdom of God. If you're not able to give and receive love, you're here today and that's kind of hard for you because some of the experiences that you've been through and the wounds that are absolutely very real, I get it. But you need to hear this. If you cannot give and receive love, you cannot operate in the kingdom of God. You are not operating. You cannot seek the kingdom or see the kingdom of God realized in your life. Y'all okay? Y'all with me okay? That's why Jesus said, this is how people know that you're my disciples. This is it. This is the, this is the whole thing, man. This is the whole, this is the whole reason. <laughs> and I know it sounds simple. This is so simple, right? This is, maybe, maybe it's because of its simplicity, some of you moved on from it too quickly before it was able to do the work that it was intended to do. You went on to things that tickled your knowledge. 
made you feel deeper or more important instead of staying here. You're at your best when you focus on love. 1 Corinthians 13 and 13 says, In this life, we have three lasting qualities, faith, hope, and love. And among these three, look what he says, but the greatest of them is what? Greater than faith and hope? Love is the greatest. And then the very next verse, you know in your Bible, it, you got chapters and verses, right? You got a, the original manuscripts that were written, the Bible was not, there was no numbers and chapters. It was just one. And so we added that to give us context to what was being read and to, so we can find things easier. And so that was added later, those numbers and verses, the chapters and stuff, that wasn't in there. The very next sentence after this sentence is chapter 14, verse one, but it's the very next sentence. The greatest of these is love. And look what the Living Bible says, very next sentence. He says, so make love your greatest aim. Just think about that phrase for just a moment. Make love the real target. Make love the thing you're trying to accomplish. Make love your greatest aim. Make love your focus. Now, what is God trying to say to us? this? Here's what I think. I think that we as individuals and especially we as Christians, we have made our aim so many other things other than love. In fact, if you were to ask someone or even ask yourself, like, what does it mean to be a committed follower of Jesus? Before you knew the topic of my sermon today, you would have probably said a whole bunch of other things other than this. You would have probably went on about, about things, our actions, our church stuff, and, or maybe Bible knowledge and information and how much like, you could spout off and, and what you've learned and experienced in classes or, or things like that. You would have probably said so many other things than this. But if you really search the scriptures, you're going to find out the answer is so, much far, is so far away from that fact, which it discovers that the Bible... Uh, in the Bible, is that being a Christian is not about so much what you know, it's about how much you love. How much you love. What you discover is that God is a whole lot less concerned about your knowledge and understanding, and He's a whole lot more concerned about your relationship with Him and how you treat other people. This is what the kingdom of God is all about. Like l- last week, we kind of helped you answer what is God's will? Right? Well, here's a good rule of the kingdom of God. When you don't know what to do, do what love requires of you. When you don't know what to do, usually I can find, like even when I don't know what to do, usually I can determine what love would do, what love. So when you don't know what to do, just do what love would require you in that situation. Focus on the kingdom of God. Focus on love. So what I want to do today is, uh, is study the love chapter with you. First Corinthians chapter 13 and and in, in, in it, it's, it shows the, pri- the, the importance of love, the priority of love. Because today, if you're here, and, and maybe you've had some experiences in some, some relationships, some hurt, some wounds that have damaged, diminished your ability to really let people in, to be loved, and to love, how do you get back to that place then? How do I get to, back to that place where I can operate from love? That I can operate from love the domain of the king and see his dominion realized in my life. How do we get back there? I'm going to help you out with that. First, let me show you the priority of love in your Bible, okay? First Corinthians chapter 13, we're going to dissect it all. Here's, here's, if you're taking notes, here's the first thing it says. Number one, without love, all I say is ineffective. Without love. Look at it with me in First Corinthians 13. We'll start with verse one. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but I don't have love. I'm only a resounding gong. I'm just a noise, a clanging cymbal. So if you like to use your words, you're suave with your words, or you're a communicator, and the world is impressed by great orators and stuff. The Bible says words aren't the key, but the heart behind them is the key. And really, what we say is not so much as important as the motive behind what we're saying which is why the Bible says in Ephesians 4.15, speak the truth, sure, but, but don't just tell it like it is. Speak the truth in the spirit of love, which is one of the reasons I despise doctrinal debates. Like debates about doctrine, I can't, I can't stand them because it goes against this. We think the goal is being right. 
And that's not the goal, according to the Bible. The goal, the aim is love, not corrective, not correctness. Love is the aim. The second thing you realize about love is this. Number two, without love, all I know is incomplete. I want to just stop right here for a minute because I think this is, there's an inordinate passion in our society, in our culture for more knowledge. We have so much access to information and knowledge more than ever before. It's like so readily available that we can learn and grow and research. And I think we measure Christianity based on what fits in our brains, some of us. We measure our faith based upon how much we know. And we like the fact so much that we're learning more. And we feel good about it. We feel like better about it, that I'm learning more. Now look, I love to study, man. I love to study God's word. I love to study. I, I, I love the sound doctrine. That's a lot of what track one is about. It's two Sundays from now. You're going to, you know, we'll tell you what our doctrine is and we'll, the specifics of our theology and beliefs and all those things are important. We have those. We have a truth basis based on God's word. But the Bible is saying that's not the goal. The goal is not for you to get smarter. The goal isn't to study the Bible more. Now, that's an important thing. I advocate for that. I teach that, you guys. I'm not discounting that. I'm just trying to, to, to enlighten you today that that's not the ultimate aim. The ultimate aim is not to study more, to know more, to learn more and grow more. The ultimate aim is love. 1 Corinthians 13 and 2, he says, if I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and knowledge, in other words, you are the smartest Christian in the room, dude. You, you've read more of the Bible than anybody. You're the Einstein of Christianity, <laughs> okay? But I don't have love. Your balance is zero. Nothing. It's, it, it's as if God, it doesn't show up in heaven. No, nope. God does not count that. You could be a Bible scholar and miss the point. And I think this was Jesus' message to the religious scholars, the religious people of their day. And I think we need to be careful I'm just going to you know, I'm just going to say this. I debated whether I should or not, but I'm going to say it. This is this is one of the re, one of the things I despise about re, the religious system of not Christianity itself, but the religious system of Christianity is is we can take it to a place where we love our doctrine and we love our our our, our particular brand of truth more than God. Or our particular our, our particular doctrine more than we even love people. So we'll, we'll, we'll want to know what people's doctrine are based upon what their doctrine and what they believe determines how I treat you. We love our particular brand of truth, our brand of church, our brand of preaching, and, and above the biggest idea of Scripture, and that is like what's going on inside of us. So we're correct, but we're stale. And, and there's just something wrong about that, you know? There's so much knowledge available to us. I think a lot of us are knowledge junkies. I mean, I think it's good. Knowledge and information, it's, it's good, but it's so readily available to us. I think we value it too much. We prioritize it too much as if it was the aim, like that's the target that you've been searching for and shooting for to know more. We think it's the answer. But we have more knowledge in the world more than ever before, and look where it's gotten us. The big idea is love. That's why the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 8, 1, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Here's another thing. Come on, say amen if you're with me, you guys. Are you with me, okay? I understand. This is it's so simple. Love, yeah, no, I get it. It is. It is. But this is what it's always been about. This was the plan. Number three, without love, all I believe is insufficient. Look at this next verse in verse 2. He says, and if I have faith, that can move mountains. Wow, what a big faith. They got some big faith, but no, I don't have love. I'm nothing. See, some people erroneously believe that the secret to Christianity is having the right belief system. If I just believed all the right stuff, if I get my belief right and my doctrines right and get that all kind of lined up, I got bad news for you, man, for those of you that believe that. The devil believes too. It's not just about believing God. Well, I believe God. Well, that's not enough. 
The Bible says that there is a tangible, measurable thing that expresses it. It shows it. It proves it. And it's how you obey God and treat other people. Jesus said, if you love me, you would obey me. Now, don't get that all twisted, y'all. So, oh, I got to obey God. No, no, he didn't, he didn't say, if you obey me, then you'll love me. He didn't say that. He said, if you love me, the result's going to be you're going to follow me. See, again, that's the religious system that some of us are in, man. It's like you're, you're trying to learn more, do more, be right, be correct. No, no, no. God's, Jesus is saying, no, 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 just love, just love. Here it is. Love me, and I'll do the rest. I'll do it inside of you. It's not about a belief system. That's why the Bible says in Galatians 5, verse 6, you should mark this verse somewhere, memorize this, you guys, Galatians 5 and 6. The only thing that counts, can you get any stronger language than that in the Bible? The only thing that counts is the fact that you have faith and that faith is expressing itself in love, which means it isn't it like, it's not about the label you wear or the, that you attended church or that you're a believer, but that it has a tangible, measurable expression in our world. That without love, all I know is incomplete, all I believe is insufficient. Let's look at this next one, number four. Without love, all I give is insignificant. It doesn't matter what I give without love. Verse three, we're just dissecting this chapter, the love chapter. Verse 3, if I give all I possess to the poor, forget tithing, you give it all away. Like your bank account zero, the house is gone, you give the car, like, like it's all gone. God, are you pleased now? Are you happy with me now, God? But if you didn't do it in love, it's as if you didn't give anything. Isn't that huge? That God still says, that isn't the measuring stick. Without love, it doesn't count. Why? Because without love, it's not a part of the king's domain. You didn't do it. You did it for, it's, it doesn't count. It doesn't show up there. And then finally, number four, five, without love, all I accomplish is inadequate. Oh, man. Some of you have been on this journey of Christianity or religion or holiness or perfection. Some of you are seeking perfection. Or knowing God more, and you're coming up empty. And you even tried to pursue some things in life that you were sure were going to make you happy. Things like money, or success, or relationships. And those things, I mean, those things can be wonderful things. They're not inherently bad in and of themselves, but you're still coming up empty. And you know, like in your spirit, some of you know, like there's a void in your heart. Something is missing. And the Bible makes it very clear when it says in verse 3, even if I deliver up my body to be burned, like I martyr myself for the cause, for this thing, I, I, even if I just give it all, but I don't have love, I gain nothing. That, that mean, you know what that means? It means this truly is the greatest aim of your life. And some of us, the devil has come into our life and through a series of circumstances or people or events, our hearts are messed up. Now we... Some of you know the Bible more than you've ever known the Bible before. And something's still missing. And my prayer for you today is that your capacity to be loved and to give love will grow. That you would see the kingdom of God in your situation. That, that you would seek heaven's solutions for your problems. Because there's something there, something walled up, hurt, messed up on the inside. And you're getting a lot of other things right, but this is still not working. There's a love wound somewhere in your life. And the giving and receiving side of love has been distorted. That, that maybe it really wasn't like about that. Like the enemy's plan was not just to cause the pain in that relationship or the hurt or the wall or even the division between you and your parents or something like that. Maybe, maybe there was a whole bigger scheme going on that he was actually attacking your design. That he was after your ability to receive love and to give love. That if he can get you out of this spirit of love, he can remove the power of the kingdom of God in your life. And you, look, and you still, I mean, 
you know the Bible and you go to church and you do good things, but you know something's walled off inside of you or calloused. Am I preaching to you today? Are you guys receiving this, you guys? There's two sides of love. First John chapter 4, verse 7. Let me show you. He says, dear friends, let us love one another. There it is again. Love. Well, that's easy. No, it isn't, right? Let us love one another. Love comes from God. And everyone who loves, if you're doing it right, it's because you're connected to God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. But if you're having trouble loving, look at it. Whoever does not love does not know God. And I would say that we've never experienced God because God is love. In other words, if we want to increase our love capacity, you can't just do the list. You can't just look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and be like, I'm going to do that. I'll just do that. No, no. The first thing you need to do, write it down. The first thing you need to do is receive the love of God. The greatest thing that you can do to increase your love capacity is to experience the greatest love expression ever shown to man. And this is huge. And this is like a lot of people, this is the hardest thing to receive. Even church people, the hardest thing to receive is God's love. And, and, and the reason why church people have a hard time with this is because there, there's so much distortion of how you view God. Some of us have a wrong view of God, like God is angry at you, so quick to, to judge you or spank you or be like belittle you, like you got the wrong view of God and it's affecting how you're relating to him and receiving love for him. I call it the Wizard of Oz God. Like you want poo, fire, and smoke and stuff, right? Some of you, uh, like... You want to get home, back home to Kansas, but you need to prove yourself to the wizard first. That's what you feel like. Like you have to perform for him, and if you do that, the great and mighty Oz will accept you and let you go home. A lot of people, they got a distorted view about God. It's hard for them to receive love from God. Some of you, it's because of your relationship with your earthly father that you have a distorted view of God. That's why you need to know. Please hear me. Look up here. me. Look, listen. God loves you just the way you are. He, 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 decide, he was committed to you long before you ever committed to him. Long before you ever decided to step foot into church, he committed to you. While you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. Ephesians 3.19 says it like this. May you experience, not know, not understand, not wrap your mind around but experience this love. The love of Christ, though actually it's, it's too great for you to understand fully. You can't wrap your mind around this. You're not going to understand it. It's something you got to experience for yourself that you were designed for, by the way. Your mind, your body, your soul, your heart, all of it was designed to love God. He's actually talking to Christians here. The Apostle Paul is writing to a Christian people, the church of Ephesus. And he's saying, look, guys, like I want you to experience it. You need to experience the love of Christ. It's greater than your understanding. Then you will. Hey, you got to experience this because this is the secret. Then you will be made complete. You're not going to be made whole by more by what you know and, and how much you learn, how you grow. No, when you experience the love of Christ, then you'll be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. It was always right here, and it was always so simple. It was. It was always so simple. This was always it. Like, it was this, this, this love, this experiential, relational love, the, the ability to intimately and vulnerably receive the love of God would do such a deep, transforming work that the kingdom of God would be released in me to make me complete and fill me with the power of God. That it was always this. It was always love. And maybe some of you move so quickly on from it instead of allowing it to do the deep, powerful work that God desired and intended his love to do in your life. Maybe you move so quickly on trying to fix stuff and be better and do and 
perform rather than letting him love, experiencing the love of Christ. I know it's so simple, isn't it? Could it be? Could it be that simple, you guys, that we maybe just have the wrong focus, the wrong aim? See, once I receive the love of God, write this down, now I can share the love of God. See, you're never able to do it until you experience it yourself. I love this verse, 1 John 4, 19. We love because he first loved us. I can only love him to the measure that I have received love from him. Receiving the love of God gives me the capacity for love that I didn't have before. I, I think that some of you that, that love God, know God, and some of you maybe ran away from God. I think that in our hearts, there's things that have happened, experiences and wounds and hurts and offenses, all that stuff that have happened that have caused us, it, it, it calloused our heart. We allowed it to. To where we don't, it's hard for us to be intimate. It's hard for us to trust people. It's hard for us to love and because of that, listen to me, you fell into the enemy's hand. Because it really wasn't about them. It wasn't about that. It wasn't about that hurt. It wasn't about that pain. It wasn't about that situation. It was always about this. This is what he was after. To callous this. To diminish this. He was after your design. You were designed for this. You were designed completely, all of you, mind, body, soul, spirit, to love God. Why? Because that is the transforming power of God that releases his domain and kingdom in and through your life. I did this last, like, I, I know this is, y'all y'all okay if, if I pastor you for a moment? Okay, can I just pastor you just for a moment, okay? Usually this is the time of the service where I say, bow your heads and close your eyes and stuff. But I want to challenge you, if, if, you're, if you're physically able and your knees are up for it, I'd like us to get on our knees before God. And if, you, if you can't, maybe you could just bow where you are. But I think what, what we need to do is allow God to break up the hard ground and to come back to this place of love and surrender. Can we do that? Can we just, and even online, wherever you're at, can you just posture yourself? For surrender. Oh God, break up the hard soil of our heart. Forgive us, God, for allowing the, the disappointments and the unmet expectations and the hurts and the people in the circumstances to, to infect our heart. We ingested it. We, we held on to it, God, and it, it, it's walled us up from you. It caused us to seek to perform rather than to be. To please you through other means than just to be. God, break up the hard ground of our heart. We want to experience your love. Come back to our design lover of God. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.